as baby seal belonging to Mr. Allen of Portland came into the limelight last week and he had his name in all the newspapers because he wandered off and was found hopping along the railroad tracks. No one knows where he was headed for, but here he is back home in his own little coop. And don't you think that he was very foolish indeed to leave playmates like these? And here we're trying to get him to have his perhaps noonday lunch, but he wouldn't be tempted by the fish, so they got his little playmate. And as you can see, perhaps, his little alligator. Look at him, he's just wild about it and wants it. But of course, out of sympathy for the alligator, well, the little baby seal didn't have his lunch. Now we're going to have him right out on the lawn in Mr. Allen's backyard for a close-up. See this cute little fellow here? Notice those long whiskers. He's not very old, but he certainly has an age-old seal's growth of whiskers. But that isn't the kind that you make a fur coat out of. No. <laughs> journey last week, we will continue our journeys on the moon, but before continuing further, I would like to explain that these craters that we see are not all, are not generally considered of volcanic origin. Many great astronomers think they are due to impact or the striking of large bodies on the surface of the moon while it was still soft. I will now show you Plato. This great black crater is most interesting due to a series of small white spots that come and go and are thought by some to be jets of vapor. These are the only signs of activity apparent on the moon. These mountains are known as the Apennines. At the upper end, you see the mysterious crater Aristophanes. The figure in the center looks like the ruins of an ancient city, but has been found with large telescopes to be mountain formations. Notice the straight wall between the two small craters. It is 65 miles long and so straight that it appears to be artificial. At one time, it was thought to be an indication of life on the moon. This is another of the many wonders on the moon. 
This lunar landscape shows you in a graphic way just how rugged the mountains are due to the fact that there's no atmosphere, therefore no wind, no moisture or frost or any form of erosion to wear them away. The force of gravity is only one-sixth that of the Earth. Boys, if you were here, you would have some game of leapfrog. The effort to make an ordinary jump on the Earth would take you 30 feet on the moon, believe it or not. We will now leave the moon, but in two weeks from tonight at this theater, I will try to show you how we find objects in, in the sky that cannot be seen. Friends of the Earth, we are now about to start on a series of trips through outer space by means of the, of the telescope, one of the greatest inventions of modern times. There, if for the benefit of those who are not familiar with this type of instrument, I would like to explain them. There are two general types. There's a refracting type, like the Great Yerkes Blast, wherein the objective is the, at the upper place at the upper end, and the light passing through is reflected, or is carried to the eyepiece at the lower end, looking directly at the object. This type is very successful, up to about 12 inches. But after that, the glass becomes so thick that the absorption of light rather kills the power. So from then on, it is necessary to use the reflecting type of telescope. The great telescope at Mount Wilson and the Dominion Observatory at Victoria, B.C. are of this type. It is by means of these glasses that the great photographs of nebula and planets that we see so many of have been made. I'd like to show you the action of the reflecting type of telescope by means of which we will travel. All large telescopes are mounted on what we call an equatorial axis. Or you, you'll pardon me while I put on my official astronomical bonnet. Every astronomer should have a stocking cap because it keeps his ear, ears warm on cold nights and he can get his head close to an eyepiece to maneuver the glass in this manner. The polar axis of a telescope, this axis here, of course, is, is parallel with the axis of the Earth. And as a star rises in the east, we place the telescope on it in this manner, with a camera fastened to the telescope and a clock to turn the two, and it follows the star slowly across the sky, keeping the image in perfect alignment. It's possible to focus the star for one hour, five hours, seven hours, or if necessary, 24 hours, all the way around the clock. The telescope is now directed toward the moon, our nearest neighbor in space. Take a trip with me to, the, to this lost world in the Oregon Sound News at this theater two weeks from tonight. You are now looking at the moon. No atmosphere, no water, no life, a dead world in space. If we look toward the southwest in the evening, uh, about 7.30 in the evening, we we'll see a bright star, which is the planet Saturn. I'm directing you toward this planet now because it's the only one visible in the evening sky, and in many ways it's the most remarkable in the sky. The globe of the planet is about nine and a half times the size of the Earth, and is the only object in the heavens that we know of surrounded by a ring system. The outer ring is about 173,000 miles in diameter. If we were on Saturn, can you imagine an evening sky in which you could see all the stars that we can see from the Earth, and in addition, ten moons, varying in distance from the planet, and a series of rings, one inside of the other, extending like an enormous rainbow from horizon to horizon, and reaching up 50,000 miles into the sky. Think what a glorious spectacle this would be. These rings are whirling swiftly around the planet, a complete revolution in 10 hours and 14 minutes, and are composed of millions of small particles of matter, each particle moving in its own orbit. Although these rings extend out so far away from the planet, they are very thin, probably less than 50 miles, and sometimes a star can be seen shining through them. We learned, if you remember, that our own moon is about 139,000 miles from the Earth. Saturn has 10 moons, based from the edge of the ring out to about 8,860,000 miles from the planet. The composition of Saturn has long been a mystery because of its light weight. 
It weighs 30% less than water and is lighter than practically any solid substance we have on Earth. Our next journey will be to Jupiter, the largest of all the planets, at this theater two weeks from tonight. Before making another journey into space, I will try to give you a few details about the reflecting telescope. To begin with, I'll show you how we see the image. Light traveling in a straight line strikes the large mirror at the bottom of this tube. The 16-inch mirror, which you see through the opening, gathers 6,400 times the light of your natural eye. The light is then reflected in a cone, which must be accurate to a one thousandth of an inch, to this flat mirror. You will notice that this mirror is also silvered on the surface. It must be flat to a millionth of an inch because the, any error would be magnified many times. The light is now reflected to a single point where it is viewed through a high-power microscope called the eyepiece. The next necessary thing about a telescope is to be able to find the object which we wish to view. To find an object invisible to the natural eye, first we must find the right ascension and declination, which is the longitude and latitude of the heavens, from a chart. We sight our on a star with a known right ascension. Then we set our clock from the telescope or the right ascension or side area of time. We now set the right ascension circle at the desired point and clamp it. We swing the telescope until the correct side area of time, as shown by the clock, is indicated on the vernier. Our object is now in the field. 